All right. Um, so I'm Daniel Holtz, and it's so nice to see so many people here. Everybody loves black holes. We have black holes. Black holes are the best. You speak up. Yes. Oh, you can't hear me? Okay. Well, okay. So welcome to the Aspen Center for Physics Public Lecture. Um, the series is sponsored by the Nick and Maggie DeWolf Foundation, and I've been sponsoring these lectures for 30 years. Um, and this gives us a chance to kind of give back to the community. And the stuff we're doing here, you get to hear a little bit about um, what we're excited about and really cutting edge science. Um, so every winter, groups of about 100 physicists come, meet right in this room. We've been meeting all week in this room. Uh, we're here for a week and we just discuss one topic in depth. This week, the topic is extreme black holes. Tuvi actually is one of the organizers of the conference. Um, so we're discussing small black holes, supermassive black holes, the biggest black holes in the universe, everything in between. Um, we're discussing uh, nearby black holes. We're discussing black holes at the very edge of the universe. Uh, and again, everything in between. Uh, we're discussing observations from telescopes, uh, simulate com computer simulations, uh, theory, everything. Uh, everything that we can think of to kind of teach us about black holes. Uh, we're arguing about how, black hole, how the universe makes black holes, uh, um, you know, what the future of black holes will be in terms of research and data, uh, all of this. It's really been an incredible week so far. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have a couple more days to go. So I should say I first came to the center when I was an undergraduate, uh, came for a summer workshop, uh, and it was just mind blowing. I mean, all these luminaries in the field discussing all these profound questions uh, and then going off and hiking and biking and just the combination was irresistible and I think the center really played a major role in why I'm a physicist today and I've come, I come as often as I can this place is truly unique really special um, and so for example yesterday I was on one of the Highlands lift with a friend and colleague discussing how to measure distances to black holes using gravitational waves and we would go up the lift and get into these intense arguments and then have these beautiful runs down and back on the lift more intense. I mean, that's just bad. Okay. You could just, I mean, you all know that Aspen is special, but you know, it's really special. So thank you for sharing Aspen with us. I could spend the rest of the hour talking about Aspen and the center of physics, but I'm here to introduce Suvi, so let me do that. So, Suvi is an astronomer. She's a world renowned expert in transient sources. So, you might think the sky is kind of quiet and boring, except for the planets and the moon, but it's actually extremely lively. And that's what Suvi studies. She's really an expert in you know, things that go bump in the night, how to find them. She kind of thinks about ways to identify them and then go out and she finds them and then studies them. So, it's really amazing. It's been very rich, very important field really growing very dynamic, and that's part of what we've been discussing at this conference. Um, her, her main thing is how black holes eat stars, so you'll probably hear about that today. Um, so she received her bachelor's from Brown, her master's from UCLA, her PhD from Columbia. She was a postdoc post at Caltech and Johns Hopkins, and then was a professor at the University of Illinois. In 2020, she moved to the Space Telescope Science Institute, which is the institute that runs the Hubble Space Telescope and the James Webb Space Telescope. So you can see this is kind of the mecca of astronomy. And Subi's there and she's chair of the science staff. So she sorts of sits on top, like it's in charge of all the scientists, 100 plus scientists, uh, astronomers at the institute. Um, she's also a science lead on two NASA mission concepts, one uh, ultraviolet telescope and one an X-ray telescope. Um, She's won numerous awards, including National Science Foundation Career Award, and she was selected as the American Astronomical Society Cogley Foundation Plenary Lecturer. And I'm sure Suvi's proudest honor is that she's also been selected as a general member of the Aspen Center for Physics. Yeah. So she helps run this place um, and, and make it so awesome. And uh, so with that, let me welcome Suvi, please. <laughs> Hi, what a wonderful introduction. Um, Aspen is indeed very, very special. And uh, I'm really excited to be here, having organized uh, a conference this week on extreme black holes. 
And I'm also excited to be a general member here at the Aspen Center for Physics. So my talk today is to talk about black holes in the spotlight. And indeed, indeed, this is a very exciting time to study black holes. In just the last few years, um, there have been two Nobel Prizes in physics awarded related to the study of black holes. Uh, one in 2017 for the discovery and detection of gravitational waves, for black hole binary systems, and one more recently in 2020 uh, for the discovery of the supermassive black hole in our own Milky Way galaxy. And I just want to note that one of the Nobel Prize winners is uh, Professor Andrea Ghez at UCLA, who is also a member of the Aspen Center for Physics and comes here often. Okay. So we actually know uh, that there is a whole wide uh, spectrum of black holes in the universe. And in particular, there are two classes of black holes that we know to exist in the universe. The first are stellar mass black holes, and the second are supermassive black holes. Now, stellar mass black holes we find in binary systems in our galaxy. And supermassive black holes, we actually find in the centers of almost every galaxy, including our own Milky Way. Now, stellar mass black holes are actually an expected outcome of massive star evolution. However, supermassive black holes, we have absolutely no idea how they form. So before we get started, let's warm up a bit and um, you on your toes and a little pop quiz. So how will our sun end its, end its life in about 5 billion years? Do you think it'll end its life as a white dwarf, a neutron star, a black hole, or I would rather not know? <laughs> you want to yell out your answers, what you think? Okay, so we have a little bit, some people think white dwarf, some people think neutron star, some people just don't want to know. Uh, well, it turns out that fortunately for us, the sun will end its life not as a black hole, but as a white dwarf. Now, unfortunately for us, it will swell into a red giant and envelop the earth in the process. However, um, it will die as a white dwarf, but it is the high mass stars, stars more than eight times the mass of our sun, that do uh, end their lives in a violent supernova explosion and leave behind either a neutron star or a black hole, depending on how massive they are. Okay, so we know black holes exist in the universe. Well, how do we know that? How do you observe something that emits no light? Well, throughout this talk, I'm gonna be showing you various ways in which we actually observe black holes in the universe. One fortunate uh, aspect of black holes is that stellar black holes often form in binary systems. This is because massive stars tend to form in binaries. And so we can often um, detect a black hole, not by the black hole itself, but from gas that flows onto the black hole from a companion star when it's in a binary system. I'm also gonna be talking today about how we see uh, black holes in binaries through gra gravitational waves. We also have evidence of a single free-floating black hole. Right now, we only have evidence of one of them, but we assume there are many more in our galaxy. And the way we detected this is by the brief brightening of a star as a black hole passed in front of it. And this is due to the fact that black holes uh, uh, add end space time, and they cause light to curve around and this causes both a brightening and a shifting of the position of the star. So this was a beautiful result in which a combined ground-based uh, images, uh, from a telescope observing from the ground, monitoring the brightness of stars in our galaxy. And then when they had an event that seemed to be uh, due to a black hole, what we call microlensing event, um, they also observed this star with the Hubble Space Telescope and they use the very precise angular resolution of Hubble to actually measure shift and position of the star. 
those two observations, the amplification of the star's brightness and its shift on the sky can be used to determine that the dark object moving in front of the star was in fact a seven solar mass black hole floating in our own Milky Way. Well, what happens when we look in the very center of our galaxy? It turns out the center of our galaxy is rich with stars and gas and dust. So to actually be able to see through all of that gas and dust, we, dust, we use infrared observations. We use, this is uh, the Keck telescopes um, on Hawaii, and they use powerful um, adaptive optics technology to get very high resolution images in the infrared of the center of the galaxy. And what you see when you look very carefully at the center of the galaxy is a rich environment of stars and gas. And uh, this is mapping it at as exquisite resolution. And if you take multiple images of the center of the galaxy, you can actually see the motions of individual stars in the center of the galaxy. And it turns out they're moving really fast. They're moving so fast that you can actually map out the uh, entire orbits of some of the stars uh, within our lifetime. So here is an um, example of monitoring that was done by the Keck the Keck Telescope by the UCLA Galactic Center Group led by Andrea Ghez. And by taking images uh, over a time scale of, uh, from 1995 to 2016, you can uh, track the motions of these stars. And from each of these stellar orbits, you can determine how much mass is enclosed in the orbit, what's causing the star orbit around. It turns out that these stellar orbits indicate that there's a mass in the center it is 4 million times the mass of the sun. But there is no light there, at least in optical wavelengths. And so this incredibly massive object is in an extremely small volume and is not emitting any very little any light. And so it must be a black hole, a supermassive black hole of 4 million times the mass of the sun. Well, it turns out that the Milky Way is not unique. And when we look carefully in the centers of nearby galaxies where we can resolve the motions of stars and gas in the very center, we also see evidence of supermassive black holes. We think uh, supermassive black holes are in the centers of almost every galaxy. Okay, so we know of these black holes from the motions of stars and gas, in their very center. Uh, but very recently, we now also have an image of two black holes. The first uh, was done in 2019. These are both by the Event Horizon Telescope, uh, produced a very, very high resolution image of a black hole uh, in the elliptical galaxy M87. And the resolution of this image is so good that you can actually resolve the size of the event horizon around the black hole. In 2022, they repeated uh, this intensive uh, set of observations in the radio. Uh, to actually resolve the innermost regions of the black hole in our own Milky Way. So how did they do this? Well, they had to simulate the re resolving power of an extremely large telescope. And the way they did that is they combined the light the telescopes distributed all across the Earth and used the method of interferometry to produce extremely high resolution imaging. And so the re resolution they can achieve is a thousand times the resolution of the Hubble Space Telescope. You need that resolution to uh, resolve these very, very small structures. What's really fun is that these two black holes are very different. The um, black hole in M87 is 6.5 billion solar masses. Uh, we know that from, again, from the dynamics of stars and gas in the center of the galaxy. And we know our own uh, Milky Way's black hole is only 4 million solar masses. But these two donuts kind of look the same on the sky. And, uh, but what's really amazing is that the sizes of the inner regions of these donuts are exactly what you'd expect um, given the sizes, the masses of the black holes that we know are there. Why are these two donuts the same size? Well, some of you may hate equations, but they're good for you. So I'm gonna give you a few simple equations um, today. So the angular size of these donuts on the sky depend on how big they are physically, which we're calling R, their radius, divided by D, which is their distance from it, from us. 
So it turns out that from general relativity, we know that the event horizon around the black hole scales with the black hole mass. So if I change, remove, replace the R with M, where ma M is the mass of the black hole, you see that the angular size depends on how massive the black hole is on the sky, or sorry, how massive the black hole is and how far away it is. Well, it turns out um, that if you want to know what is going to be the angular size of the Milky Way's black hole versus M87, and you take the ratio of their masses and distances, it just so happens that the Milky Way, with M87 is far away enough that it sort of cancels out the fact that it's a much bigger black hole, and you end up getting a ratio about 1.2. So actually the Milky Way's uh, black hole in the sky is slightly bigger. This is similar to the reason why we can have uh, a solar eclipse where the moon can exactly have the same angular size as the sun, even though it's so much smaller, but it's so much closer to us uh, than the sun. Okay, so I showed you images of a black hole. But what about this new window into black holes um, from the detection of gravitational waves? These are the ripples in space time that are caused by the rapid motion of very massive objects. And in fact, we now have uh, detectors, these are gravitational wave observatories on Earth um, that use laser interferometry to detect gravitational waves. Now, this is pretty mind blowing, but in order to de detect these stellar mass black holes that are emerging in the universe, we need to be able to measure the change in distances with these interferometers using these lasers and mirrors. We need to use, be able to me measure changes in distances that are caused by, as a gravitational wave passes by detector um, through an accuracy of one ten thousandth width of a proton. It's hard to even visualize the precision that this takes. But not only have we built detectors that have this precision, they have successfully detected uh, gravitational wave signals from black holes um, merging in our universe. And here's an example of how all three detectors measure the characteristic signal of the gravitational wave from a black hole, black hole merger. And shown here is this, um, this quantity called the strain, which is given up there, which is the amplitude or the change in length uh, relative to the length of these uh, arms of the interferometer precision to which uh, you need to measure these changes. And this is to a factor of 10 to the minus 21. So these are extremely, extremely difficult measurements, but they have been successfully done. Not only have they done it once, um, but in the last few years, they now have over 90 black hole, black hole merger uh, detections. And they even have a few uh, detections of a neutron star and black hole merging. And then a very famous example of two neutron stars merging, which also were detected in light. So we now have this spectacular view of these black hole binary systems in our uh, universe. And we not only know that they're black holes merging, but we know um, a lot about their masses. And now we're starting to understand the true uh, range of black hole masses that you can get. Uh, from stellar evolution and maybe other processes, like black hole, black hole mergers. Okay, so not only are these stellar mass black holes merging, so these black holes on the order of a few to tens of times the mass of the sun, we also expect binary supermassive black holes. And we expect that these binary supermassive black holes should be the strongest gravitational wave signals in our universe. So why do we expect binary supermassive black holes? Well, the stellar mass black holes we thought would be in binaries because stars massive stars tend to form in binary. Well, supermassive black holes don't necessarily form as binaries, but we know for sure that over the cosmic history of the universe, galaxies collide. And we not only know this through our understanding of sort of the large scale evolution of the universe, we see these beautiful images from the Hubble Space Telescope of galaxies in the process of colliding. Now, I already told you that we think that ev almost every galaxy has a supermassive black hole in its center. So 
So when these galaxies collide and merge, we also expect that the black holes will eventually sink down to the center of this galaxy merger system, become gravitationally bound, and uh, eventually merge, uh, emitting gravitational waves. So um, given how massive these black holes are and that we expect these binary systems in the universe, um, why aren't I have, why don't I show you some nice plots of all the binary supermassive black holes we've been detecting? Well, it turns out that our uh, laser interferometers on Earth, like LIGO, Virgo, Kagra, um, these kinds of uh, laser interferometers cannot detect uh, gravitational waves from supermassive black holes. So why is that? Well, I told you that um, these supermassive black hole systems should be very, very loud in gravitational waves. That's because the um, amplitude or the strain uh, caused by the gravitational wave is proportional to the mass. So we really expect these things to produce, be producing strong gravitational wave signals. However, the frequency of the gravitational waves scales inversely with mass. So what this means is that given we're talking about supermassive black holes that are at least a million times the mass of the sun, it means that the frequency of these waves is going to be a millionth times the gravitational wave frequency of the stellar mass black holes. Now, to detect these very low frequency gravitational waves, um, we need to measure pos these positions of the mirrors using these later laser interferometers on time scales a million times longer than the stellar mass black holes. That's because uh, the period is proportional to one over the frequency. So at these very long time scales, um, it's actually very, very hard to measure use these laser interferometers to measure these very small changes in distance um, that give you the gravitational wave signal. Um, and the reason for this is that on Earth, we're really uh, dominated by seismic noise on time scales any longer than uh, you know, tens of milliseconds. So if we want to be able to detect these gravitational waves from the supermassive black hole binary systems, we really have to get off the Earth. And so best thing to do, of course, is to go to space. And another advantage uh, about space, besides the fact that you don't have to deal with seismic motions, the shaking of the Earth due to geological activity. Um, the other advantage is then you can make your detectors, instead of kilom kilometers away from each other, you can put them millions of kilometers apart. And the further away you make the baseline of your interferometer, less precise you have to measure the changes of distances to measure the same amount of strain. So indeed, um, the European Space Agency, uh, along with support from NASA, is going to be launching a laser interferometer space antenna uh, in the 2030s um, to specifically be able to set sensitive to gravitational waves from supermassive black holes. Okay. I've talked a lot about binary stellar mass black holes and binary supermassive black holes. Well, what about boring old single supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies? I told you that almost all galaxies have them. It turns out that about 10% of these supermassive black holes actually do produce tons of radiation. Um, that's a result of gas that's actively feeding onto the black hole. However, the majority of supermassive black holes in our universe, including in our own Milky Way galaxy, are pretty starved of fuel and dormant. However, for the small percentage of black holes that actually are feeding on gas, uh, one uh, nice property of this feeding process is that it produces a variable flickering signal. We can use um, what we call time domain observations, use uh, repeated images of the sky to actually pinpoint this flickering in the center of a galaxy and determine that there is a supermassive black hole there and it's feeding on gas. We can also look for a more rare event when a black hole doesn't just feed on gas, but it literally gobbles up and eats a star. So what happens if a star ventures very close to a black hole? This is actually a computer simulation that shows that if a star ventures close enough, 
tidal forces of a black hole will literally rip it apart. And this is because any type of object uh, next to another object will feel tidal forces due to the differential gravity across uh, the star. And so the near side of the star will feel a stronger gravitational pull than the far side because of how um, gravitational pull depends on distance. And so this differential uh, tidal force on the star stretches it and squeezes it, just like the moon exerts tides on the oceans of the Earth. These tides near a black hole are so extreme, they can actually rip the star apart. And so we can calculate how close does a star have to get to be ripped apart. And you do this by setting the tidal force equal to the self-gravity of the star that keeps it together. And you get this characteristic radius, this distance from the black hole at which um, a star will be uh, disrupted. So how close do you have to get? Well, it depends both on the type of the star as well as the mass of the black hole. So this diagram shows the um, event horizon, which is this point of no return uh, around a black hole, which scales linear linearly with the black hole mass. That's shown in the black disk. And you can see that as you go to bigger black holes from 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 8 solar masses, this event horizon is growing linearly with the black hole mass. Shown in orange is this tidal disruption radius, this radius at which a star will be ripped apart by the black hole. And you can see that that's also growing with mass, but a little bit more slowly. Um, however, stars in our galaxy come in all different uh, sizes. And in particular, a star goes through, goes through dramatic changes through its stellar evolution. And so because the, the major differences in the density and structure of stars, um, the tidal disruption radius is very different for the sun than for a very compact system like a white dwarf, or for a very extended puffy star like a red giant. <laughs> so once a star does pass close enough to be ripped apart, the gas from the star, about half of it, um, falls back onto the black hole and is available then to feed the black hole and produce a luminous flare of radiation. So this is a computer simulation of exactly how those debris streams from the uh, stretched and ripped apart star actually then uh, fall around the black hole and start uh, feeding it to a disk. So what I've uh, focused on mostly in my career is searching for these luminous outbursts of radiation in the centers of galaxies that could be attributed to a black hole, a supermassive black hole uh, swallowing a star. The way we do this is we take advantage in this um, golden age of time domain astronomy. We now have these spectacular uh, large area um, CCD cameras that can image very, very large parts of the sky um, at once. And so you can actually, instead of just getting an image of the sky, you can take multiple image uh, every night and actually get a movie our night sky. As shown here are the various um, telescope uh, detectors uh, that are uh, on now and uh, will be in the future. And in particular, I've worked a lot on the Zwicky Transient Facility, ZTF, which has a spectacular uh, field of view and can do wonderful time domain science. Okay, so to hunt for these tidal disruption events, which is what we call these black holes eating stars, um, we use a technique called image differencing. So we take a new uh, image of the sky and we find uh, an old image that we took maybe a year ago and we take the difference and what's left is the only part of the galaxy's light that was changing, okay? okay. In this case, we see a bright spot in the center of the galaxy. That means that the galaxy suddenly got brighter in its center call that a nuclear transient. Now, before you get too excited, not every nuclear transient that we detect has to do with the galaxy's central massive black hole. In fact, um, the most common types of transients in the universe are supernovae. This is also uh, a consequence of massive star evolution. Um, when stars explode at the end of their lives, 
Uh, but we also have another class of supernovae that actually relate to the explosion of white dwarfs, but not our sun, don't worry. Um, the white dwarf has to be in a binary system in order to reach the mass to be able to explode. Um, but here is an example of a nearby galaxy where you see this discovery in 2011 of a new source um, that is a supernova, nothing to do with a black hole. The problem is, is that these supernovae, these massive star or thermonuclear explosions are associated with stars, but there are lots of stars in the centers of galaxies as well as in their outskirts. So um, you can have supernovae going off near the center of a galaxy. So we work very hard to make sure that the transient that we're detecting actually has to do with a supermassive black hole and isn't just a supernova. So um, after we filter out all these pesky supernovae, um, we have uh, detected now uh, in the last few years um, over 30 examples of galaxies who've had these outbursts of radiation from from their massive black holes uh, disrupting and accreting a star. And in fact, all the galaxies here um, have supermassive black holes around 10 to the fifth to 10 to the eighth solar masses. Okay, but what about this mysterious middle range, which we call intermediate mass black holes? Um, I've talked again a lot about stellar mass black holes and supermassive black holes. Well, this intermediate mass black hole Phenomena is sort of a um, expected to be there, but we actually have very, very little direct evidence of black holes between 100 and uh, 10,000 solar masses. However, it turns out that if we could observe the tidal disruption of a white dwarf, that would be smoking gun evidence for the existence of these intermediate mass black holes which are the missing link between these populations. So why is that? Well, it turns out that a white dwarf disruption event is only observable around intermediate mass black holes. And that's because for a supermassive black hole, for example, here shown uh, 10 to the six solar mass black hole, you can see that the tidal disruption radius of the white dwarf is inside the black hole's event horizon. That means that the white dwarf passes through and is swallowed whole before it's disrupted. And so there's no way for us to observe any what happens to it once it uh, enters the event horizon. So this is um, a fancy plot that's demonstrating exactly what range of black holes can disrupt different types of stars. So for a solar type star, a star like the sun, if the black hole is too big, then the star enters the black hole before being disrupted, so we can't see it. If the black hole is too small, then the star is actually bigger than the black hole and the black hole enters the star. So inside of this triangle is where you can see a tidal disruption of a solar type star. For a white dwarf, it's so dense, um, that this triangle region shifts. And now, in order to um, disrupt the white dwarf outside of the event horizon, your black hole has to be less than 10 to the fifth solar masses. And that's precisely in this exciting regime of intermediate mass black holes for which we have very little evidence, but we really, really want to find um, black holes in that mass range. So, um, if we were to be able to determine that a white dwarf was disrupted, we can say, ah, that must be a black hole in that galaxy less than 10 to the fifth solar masses. Otherwise, we wouldn't have seen it. Well, how are we going to know that a white dwarf is being disrupted? There are various arguments for why, what the time scales of these events will be. There'll be shorter time scales than for a solar type star. But another fun thing that can happen when a white dwarf is being disrupted is as it's orbiting around the black hole and it's approaching here within the tidal disruption radius. So it's getting um, stretched and squeezed and uh, disrupted. In the process of this stretching and squeezing, in extreme cases, you can actually squeeze the white dwarf so much that it reaches the densities and temperatures sufficient for thermonuclear burning. And so you can actually have a 
runaway thermonuclear explosion similar to a thermonuclear supernova, which we call type 1A supernovae, um, as a result of the white dwarf passing uh, by the black hole and being disrupted. So this is exciting because thermonuclear supernovae, we know, we understand really well. We use them to uh, trace the expansion of the universe and we detect them a lot uh, with our optical surveys. They produce a lot of uh, optical visible light that we can detect in our surveys. But another fun fact is this type of phenomena, a white dwarf being disrupted, is also a gravitational wave source and would potentially be detected by a space-based interferometer like LISA uh, if it was very nearby within our local group of galaxies. So in fact, I just wanted to give you uh, an example of the type of uh, data uh, that we're dealing with. And this is an example of how um, a uh, postdoc at Space Telescope and I actually decided to look for these white dwarf tidal disruption events that trigger a thermonuclear explosion. So the way we did this is we said, okay, well, where do we think these intermediate mass black holes are? We think they should be in the centers of smaller galaxies. So we're gonna look in the dwarf galaxies. And so we're gonna look for transients uh, that happen near the centers of dwarf galaxies. And in particular, we're gonna look, look for things that look like thermonuclear supernovae in the centers of dwarf galaxies. And so we went through this um, beautiful archive of transients that have from the Wiki Transient Facility. And maybe many of those transients have been followed up and characterized with spectroscopy and uh, observations at other wavelengths. And we can actually compare um, these transients to the model predictions of what a white dwarf uh, being disrupted uh, would look like uh, if it exploded. And so in the solid line, so the dots are the data. These are these light curves that you get from these time domain surveys. And the solid lines are the models. And you can see that these candidates look pretty good compared to the models. And these squiggly lines are the spectra. These are the light as a function of wavelength. And what's fun about a white dwarf when it gets disrupted and, and triggers an explosion is when it triggers the explosion, the white dwarf is moving really fast around the black hole. And so you actually expect a signature uh, shift of the lines due to the motion of the white dwarf. And so even the spectra in some of these cases uh, look like the models, the models in black, and the actual spectra is in blue. Yes. Um, so this is exciting. This is tentative evidence. And um, for, would, to really, Point these as true white dwarf uh, thermonuclear explosions from a tidal disruption event, we would want uh, other pieces of evidence like uh, X ray radiation uh, that was from the accretion of this uh, white dwarf onto the black hole. Okay, so we're just getting started. While we have these amazing optical surveys already operating, like this Wiki Transient Facility called ZTF, um, in just a couple years, we are going to have the next big facility. This is called the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. It's in Chile, and it is a huge order of magnitude uh, increase in survey power. And it's really going to be a factory for all types of transients, including supernovae and uh, variable uh, active galaxies, and of course, the tidal disruption events that I've been talking about. But don't want to just look uh, with uh, visible light. We are going to have uh, two major telescopes um, with amazing capabilities in the infrared. And of course, uh, hopefully everyone has heard about the successful launch, the James Webb Space Telescope uh, on Christmas Day in 2021, and is already taking spectacular data that's uh, getting the entire astronomical community excited. Uh, both uh, observations of the early universe and also uh, exoplanets. And in 2026, we're gonna have another major flagship mission uh, launched uh, from NASA um, to be launched about 2026. And this will be kind of like Hubble, but with a hundred times the field of view. 
So it's going to be a real game changer in terms of surveying the sky with a space-based resolution. So what are the advantages of the infrared? Well, when you go to these longer wavelengths, you can see light in the very early universe. This is due to the expansion of uh, the universe over cosmic time and the stretching of light waves from uh, shorter wavelengths to longer wavelengths. So we are really excited um, with these amazing infrared capabilities shown here as a deep field for the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, we want to be able to de detect these tidal disruption events, these black holes swallowing stars over cosmic time um, to map the growth of, of massive black holes from the early universe to today and to tackle the unanswered question of how they first form. Okay, so I began my talk uh, by wondering how do we observe black holes if they don't emit light? Well, I hope from this uh, talk today that you've seen that we actually can observe black holes in many ways. Uh, we can see X-ray radiation from uh, accretion uh, from a companion star. Those are called the X-ray binaries. Uh, we can see uh, stars uh, temporarily brightening due to the passing of a black hole in front of them due to the effect of microlensing. Uh, we can infer the presence of supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies from the uh, motions of stars and uh, uh, gas in their very centers. Uh, we can use this powerful high resolution radio interferometry to get very, very, very small scale uh, images of the actual event horizon around black holes. And we can detect these gravitational waves from black holes merging in the universe. Right now we can detect them around by, from stellar mass black hole mergers, but soon, in the 2030s, we can extend this to the supermassive black hole binary mergers. We can see active galaxies um, whose supermassive black holes are swallowing gas and producing uh, radiation in the form of um, both uh, high energy radiation and radio jets in some cases. And then we can see these rare but exciting moments when a black hole rips apart and swallows a star. And then maybe soon we can definitively detect a thermonuclear supernova that's triggered by a white dwarf tidal disruption event. Thanks. Yes. Questions. Yes. Yeah. Um, recently, I read an article about, uh, I think a black hole was observed flying through space and leaving stars in its wake. Yes, yes. Um, I thought that was fascinating, and I, I was just curious if you could touch upon that. Yeah, so one of the exciting, okay, so the um, question was, there was recent report of evidence of a black hole um, moving quickly through a galaxy and leaving a wake of stars behind it. And one of the exciting things about um, black holes is indeed they can have very large velocities uh, in a galaxy. And the way they gain those velocities is after a uh, binary supermassive black hole merger is in the process of uh, emitting gravitational waves. They can get a recoil kick uh, that launches them uh, in a certain direction, depending on the orientation of the black holes. And um, so this kick of the black hole uh, is exciting because we, one of the things we're talking about in this conference, maybe we can see these black holes after they've been kicked following a merger by looking for something that looks like an active galaxy, but instead of being in the center, it's off center. So the black hole has moved and as it moves, it can actually carry along with it, not only a disk of gas, but also a cluster of stars. And in this case, they were arguing that it was also uh, causing this um, sort of wake of stars behind it. Uh, but one of the fun things that relates to my research is that when these black holes get kicked, um, they can also um, increase the rate at which they gobble up stars. And so one potential observable that we would look for is a tidal disruption event, these nuclear flares, but instead of nuclear, Look for them off nuclear. Look, look for these type of flares, but not in the center of a galaxy, and see if you can prove that that's from 
a black hole, a supermassive black hole that was um, moving away from the center of the galaxy, but also disrupting stars in its uh, journey. Um, there was a discussion, I believe it was last year, sponsored by the Institute about holography. Is there any place for the use of that concept in discovering uh, what you're looking for? Okay, I remember there's a concept of black hole holography, but I forget what it actually is. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, tying uh, you know, information on the surface of a black hole to information from other theories and to dimensionality things. Um, oh, I just, you know, I understood it to be like uh, <laughs> holography is represent something. If you see one, one projection of something. Yeah. Project what may be behind it in, in some form, and I, I really <laughs> so that's what I, I took from it. And I'm wondering if there's any application here. Um, yeah, so I think so. Holography is quite speculative for, for this, um, and it generally applies to we think where it'll become interesting is for very small black holes, especially when they evaporate, and there may be consequences of these theories. It's not not relevant to the you know astrophysics, which is too bad because then we could test these kind of very speculative things. But. A slightly, slightly related um, note. I mean, when we talk about, for example, these event horizon telescope images of the black hole, to get to interpret those images, um, they've used extensive uh, 3D computer simulation. And so they actually simulate the plasma around black holes of different masses and spins and then different orientations. And so in some ways that EHT image is really a projection of sort of these 3D models. And so we have to take whatever information we have from the image and connect it to these true physical models. Really related. Where are you on the the in the process of determining how these were formed? Ah, yes. So, in well, yes, sorry, yes. The question was, where are we on how these um, black holes actually form? So, like the supermassive black holes. So, in every proposal that I write, the first paragraph always claims that my research is going to tell us how supermassive black holes form. Okay. And my argument is, it turns out that especially the lower mass massive black holes, so the black holes uh, less than ten to the seven, you know, less than uh, tens of millions of solar masses to thousands of solar masses, those smaller black holes give us information about how heavy those primordial black holes were, um, the original black holes were that actually grew over cosmic time to be the black holes that we see today in the centers of galaxies. And so these primordial seeds, um, so we don't know how they form. So we ask the theorists, well, how do you form a black hole in the early universe? So they say, oh, okay, well, um, what if I had a really massive star in the early universe? Okay, well, that will collapse and form a black hole, okay? And then you have another theorist who says, well, I don't know how easy it is gonna be to form those really massive stars in the early universe. I really like your idea. I have a better one. A major gas cloud is going to collapse directly into a black hole. And then you, the other theorist says, well, I don't think that's easy either. So it turns out that both ideas have are problematic, but I'm sure we'll find a solution. But as an observer, my goal is to be able to give some guidance to the theorists and tell them which of those models is more plausible. So um, it turns out that if you take those primordial seeds black holes in the early universe, either the heavy seeds formed from the direct collapse of gas clouds or the lighter seeds formed from the collapse of massive stars. And you grow them over time. So they accrete gas, they merge together and you see um, where they are today. It turns out that the smaller galaxies, if the primordial seeds were from the direct collapse of gas clouds, not every little, not every dwarf galaxy would even have a black hole. It would actually be a kind of a rare phenomena, the smaller black holes, the smaller galaxies. Whereas in the, um, they just formed from the collapse of massive stars, 
in the early universe, then almost every gal galaxy, even the dwarf galaxies, should have black holes. So what we're doing is using tidal disruption events, these um, black hole eating star events, to pinpoint, ah, there's a black hole, there's a black hole, there's a black hole. And, and because we're sensitive to these lower mass black holes, um, we can use these as a probe of uh, which, of the, which of the galaxies have black holes, and maybe convincingly test these models. That's what I say in my proposal. So far it's working, but one day we'll really do it. <laughs> when gravity waves from two sources meet, do they superimpose and form fringes of amplification cancellation zones? So the fringes that we are measuring are from when the gravitational wave reaches the earth. And when it does, it's squeezing and stretching space time as it passes. And these laser interferometer um, telescopes that we have or detectors that we have um, on the earth, they're designed with these uh, lasers and mirrors to be able to measure the, the squeezing and stretching, the change in length as the gravitational wave passes. So they use the interference between these two arms uh, to measure that distortion and get the gravitational waves. You know. Gravity wave meet. <clears throat> oh, when two sources of gravitational <laughs> waves. Oh, do we ever have enough gravitational waves sources at the same time? So you have to disentangle. I mean, uh, that's my my. I'm in the gravitational wave business, so this is a, a good question. <laughs> And uh, yeah, there's a fantastic background of gravitational waves, which is exactly that. All the black holes merging in the universe, yeah. So all the ones that Susie's talking about, all of them generate gravitational waves, and there's a hum of those, and they superimpose, superimpose because they were very weak. That was the 10 to the minus 21. It's very, very weak. So they just all kind of go on top of each other. When they get strong, that's no longer true. These black holes have a typical natural cycle where they grow and then they peak and then they, are there any signs of deterioration or do they just keep, keep getting bigger and bigger? So the question is, do black holes have a natural cycle of growth and do they get smaller or bigger? Um, so basically black holes, um, like some of us in our old age, only get bigger. <laughs> um, so they are only increasing their mass over time. And they do it through two ways, either by uh, feeding on gas that is nearby, um, or by gobbling up stars, or by bumping into each other and merging. These are these merging events that we're detecting in gravitational waves. Um, so they're constantly growing. And so sometimes you'll see a plot, where people try to simulate you know, the evolution of galaxies and black holes in the universe. And you see these merger trees where you see how the black holes are getting bigger and, and combining together. Um, but it turns out that this feeding onto black holes does have a little bit of a pattern. And there's, um, there's a, a sort of a history of how uh, fast gas is converted into stars in the universe. And it turns out that there is a time period in the universe where galaxies uh, were producing the most stars, with the highest star formation rate. And that is correlated to the period in which um, gas was being funneled into black holes the most. So there is an epic of our uh, universe's history in which galax uh, galaxies are forming stars the most and the black holes are feeding on gas the most. Any questions? I have one. I just, this may sound really mundane, but is there a practical, um, I know that's not straight, but is it just like, are we doing this because it's fascinating or do we do it because there's some application that um, we hope to find? Or is it, the, you know, because it's a huge field, tons of things that can fly into it, but. I think the, um, there are several fascinating aspects. Oh, the question is, why are we doing this? Yeah. Is there any practical application to studying black holes? <laughs> um, 
Like, ask Chat GPT that question. No. Um, I think what's amazing about uh, black holes, I mean, I think this gravitational wave um, observations are so spectacular because you take um, a phenomena that was predicted from general relativity from physics, and then you have a bunch of crazy physicists who build these detectors, and they claim to be measuring these incredibly precise. Uh, distances uh, to detect the gravitational waves. And they say, hey, a black hole, two black holes merged over there. And you say, yeah, yeah, okay, sounds good. But what was really amazing is in 2017, crazy physicists said two neutron stars merged over there, sort of a part of the sky. And simultaneously, a gamma ray satellite detected a burst of gamma ray radiation in that same sort of region. And then the crazy astronomers uh, that I know well took their telescopes and started looking at all the galaxies in that patch of sky. And lo and behold, they saw a transient, a bright source of light um, that was from the, the collision and merger of these two neutron stars. And not only did they see it in their uh, visible light, they saw it in radio wavelengths, X-ray wavelengths, ultraviolet wavelengths all across electromagnetic spectrum, all from that same spot coincident with the gravitational waves. And so there you see, wow, you know, here you're having experimental physics, have theoretical physics, observational astronomy, high energy uh, uh, astronomy, space-based astronomy, ground-based telescopes, all working together, studying the same phenomena. And so it's really spectacular. Um, and then maybe the other aspect is since our Milky Way has both a supermassive black hole in its center, the black holes all throughout, um, you're just understanding your own environment better. And uh, I don't know how to make money off of it except teaching about <laughs> black holes. And <laughs> yeah. I think we have time for one more question. So someone that hasn't asked that. Chance in the back. I have a question. Oh, yes. So, I, I heard a theory about the white holes. What do you think about the white hole? Well, white hole. Can you tell something and what do you think about it? Oh, gosh. What do I think? It is uh, Carlo Rovelli. Uh -huh. Do you know that he wrote this book? And this book now is a. Is a you can buy it. I, 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 so this would be something that emits uh, so what light. So about the, the theory about what the, is a white hole? Yeah, it's a time reverse black hole. Oh, that's cool. So the question is, what is a white hole? And it's something that comes in the theory that's the opposite of the black hole. Yeah. So uh, you say so technically, it can only come out. We must come out. Lots of stuff comes out in principle. Um, and the theory says this is possible. We don't really think they exist. It's just an interesting <laughs> mathematical thing. We, Does anyone look for them? Maybe, maybe I have a new <laughs> thing to look for. Yeah. So for me to look for them, I'd have to know, you know, what are the observable properties of such a thing and where do we expect them to form? And we could go look. <laughs> I mean, I think this will be around a little more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's not only just out of the ground. 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 It's 